Hey everybody, Jeremy Markovich here. Two quick notes before we get going. First, this podcast has a new home. It's now part of the North Carolina Rabbit Hole, which you can find at ncrabbithole.com. There you can check out previous episodes of Away Message, you can find any new episodes that we're putting out, and if you like this podcast, I think, no guarantees, but I think you will like my weekly newsletter. It is about weird North Carolina stuff, comes out every Thursday, it is free if you want it to be, and you can sign up at ncrabbithole.com. Second, this episode was produced during my time at Our State Magazine. Now, I happen to think that most of it still holds up, but some of the promo codes and websites that I mention may no longer work. Okay, here's the show. This is going to be a different kind of episode, because compared to the rest of North Carolina, Charlotte is a different kind of city. Charlotte has money, and it likes to show off. I know this. I used to live there. And another former Charlottean can back me up. And I don't mind telling you, I was wearing these $600 custom-made living shoes and this $13,000 Rolex when it happened. That's why I'm Rick Flair. And if you listen to enough of his old wrestling promos, a theme seems to develop. You're talking to the Rolex wearing, diamond ring wearing, kiss stealing, woo, wheeling, dealing, limousine riding, jet flying, son of a gun, and I'm having a hard time holding these alligators down. Okay, just humor me here. Ric Flair and the city of Charlotte are a lot alike. Flair had flash and cash. Charlotte's flash originally came from gold that was dug out of the ground, and the cash came later, courtesy of the banks. In fact, thanks to all of our deposits, Charlotte became the city that ended up with all of our money. And over the years, that money created sports teams. He's got a touchdown! It attracted important visitors saying important things. I accept your nomination for president of the United States. And it built big companies, a few of them that ended up being too big to fail. We are Wachovia, and we are here. So how did Charlotte get this way? How did it become a banking center built on top of old gold mines? And when people give you a lot of their hard-earned cash, where does that cash actually physically go? I went looking for answers and found them in places that most people do not get to go. And so today we have a supersized episode for you. Two stories for the price of one. The first about the hidden entrance to a gold mine and what's actually down there now. And another about a big underground vault that is full of enough money to bankroll a small country. But to set everything up to explain how Charlotte got big, we have to go see a guy who inhabits a place where you can see just about everything. You can look out and see the airport. You can see the mountains. You see the whole nine yards. You see what happens in your city. I can see. I know where everything is. Mm-hmm. A corner office on the 41st floor of the Bank of America Corporate Center in Uptown Charlotte. What would you do if you didn't have this office to look out on everything? I'd be miserable. I, I tell you, I love uh, working high. and it's. Uh, I'd admit that it, I don't know what I would do if I ever had to be on the ground floor. That voice you hear is Hugh McCall, the former CEO of Bank of America. He's in his 80s now and only sort of retired. And you're still working? Well, I'm still available. (laughs) (laughs) I'm talking to you, right? (laughs) As much as I'd like to say that, you know, I would just drop by Hugh McCall's office to shoot the breeze, I was actually there on assignment for Our State magazine, hence the audio from my iPhone here. I was there to ask him how he built his bank and, in effect, how he built what we think of as modern-day Charlotte. Carolina cities, Carolina towns, banks in every neighborhood, banks all around. 
Decades ago, McCall worked for North Carolina National Bank, or NCNB. NCNB, we want to be the best bank in the neighborhood. Back in the day, banks couldn't expand beyond state borders. And what that meant was NCNB could not really compete with banks in California and New York. Now, those banks were closer to heavy industry, which meant they had more deposits, which meant they had more money to lend, which made them much bigger than any bank in the South. NCNB, we wanna be the best bank in the neighborhood. And I realized this is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. You know, we're too little. My goal was to build the largest bank in the world. So, in the 1970s, McCall and NCNB find this loophole in the law that allowed them to buy a bank in Florida. And we were making money and our stock was going up, and so the other banks became jealous. And those other banks are like, hey, you know, there should be a law that allows us to expand across the southeast. That law was written by my lawyers, mm -hmm. and we got it passed state by state. And then McCall's like, forget just the southeast. Let's go national. I visited more damn congressmen and senators than you could shake a stick at. At first, Congress said no, but a new presidential candidate said yes. When Clinton was running for president, I met with him for hours one night down in Albany, Georgia. In fact, we broke up at three in the morning finally, and I convinced him that interstate banking was good for America. By the end of the 1990s, the old rules were completely gone. NCNB becomes Nations Bank, which becomes Bank of America which makes Charlotte into the third largest banking center in America. We changed the world, truthfully. We changed the entire banking industry of the United States. So as modestly as I know how to put it. Yeah. <laughs> At one point in our conversation, McCall gets up, he walks over to the window, and he starts talking about Bank of America Stadium. Mm -hmm. When I look at that football stadium, I put that there. There's no question about who put that there. Yeah. Yeah. So I decided... It, our bank was going to finance the stadium. We financed 100% of it. That we were going to do it where I wanted it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You well, you think you think a northern bank would have financed it 100%? No. From up here, you can see a lot of things, but you can't see everything, even if you're Hugh McCall, because the thing that powered Charlotte's first boom, gold. And the thing that helps sustain its current boom, a large amount of cash, those things are both underground. And I wanted to go see those things up close for myself. So we'll stop here if that's okay. <laughs> sure. And that is how I found myself at the door of a very, very big vault that sits underneath the street to Charlotte. So this is our currency vault. It's about uh, three stories high, two basketball courts wide. From Our State Magazine, this is Away Message, a podcast about what you find in hard-to-find places. I'm Jeremy Markovich. I see it. That looks so pretty. Can I have it? No. no. <laughs> we'll get back to the vault in a bit. First, the gold. How easy is it to spot? Is it just the shiny thing that's in there? Yeah, it's very easy to spot if it's in there. No is there anything in there? Nope, no gold. <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> this is the Reed Gold Mine, about 25 miles east of uptown Charlotte. The mine no longer runs, but you can still pan for gold there. Today, most of the fourth graders that are here have come up empty. But Cameron Lay still has hope. Do you feel lucky? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. All right, we got to break up the, all that mud. Uh, it can be helpful. This is actually kind of nervous. If you see something shiny, I want you to yell, okay? Just okay. yell, go. Uh, Laura I found gold. I gold! Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Are you kidding me? You know, that's not very excited for, like, his mind. Cameron, is that yours? Yes. You know, going to get excited? No. Cameron, get excited. He's the one that I would think would get excited. It's just gold. <laughs> it's just gold? Yes. Cameron is really, really chill for a kid who just found gold. Although, to be fair, it's just a tiny little fleck. Look at that. That's awesome. That's awesome. If you find gold here today, chances are you are going to find what Cameron found. But that was not always the case. Why would you pan for gold 
here. Reed Gold Mine is the site of the first documented gold discovery in the United States. This is Larry Neal, who runs Reed Gold Mine. It's now a state historical site. And this happened back in 1799 when 12-year-old Conrad Reed, while fishing actually in the creek, discovered this nice, bright, shiny rock. But he didn't know what it was. And neither did his parents. But the rock did have two things going for it. It was big and it was heavy. So they ended up leaving it on their front porch as a doorstop and walked beside this rock for three years. But one day, Conrad's father, John, says, I wonder if this big old rock might actually be valuable. So he takes it to a jeweler, and the jeweler says, John, you got yourself a 22-pound gold nugget. Name your price. Well, John thought about it, and he finally said, I'll take $3.50, because this was John Reed's farm, and that's how much money he expected to make a week off of his farm. So he figured that was a fair price. Problem was, the nugget was really worth $3,600 then. So that didn't end up working out as a, as a good business deal for, for John Reed. Well, that initial transaction, no. But when word got out, people came to John's farm to dig for gold. And by the 1830s, there was a full-blown underground mine here. But this looks like we're walking up to the mine here. Oh, it's cold. The underground mine stays an average of about 55 to 65 degrees all year round. Wow. So, and, and we're like what, like 30 feet from the entrance here? Probably more like 50 feet. 50 yeah. feet, yeah. Kind of, kind of musty in here. Well, this, you know, your natural percolation of the ground. Um, so we are 50 feet below the surface right here. Like how deep did this mine go? The Reed mine, as far as we know, the deepest point was 150 feet. Today, we can only take you 50 feet down because of the water table. In this area right now, it's about 60 feet. So we would have to pump out any water in the lower levels to access that. Is there a way to know how much gold do they find in this mine? Unfortunately, there's really no documented records of saying exactly how much gold came from here. The only thing we have really is for North Carolina as to what was given to first the Philadelphia Mint and then later the Charlotte Mint to be made into gold coins. Is it oversimplifying it to say that the reason why there was a U.S. Mint in Charlotte is because there was a gold find here and a bunch of gold being mined around here? I, you could directly say that mint <laughs> is related to the gold. They specifically built the mint branch mint in Charlotte in 1837 as a way of allow keeping miners and, and the gold mine owners to not have to travel so far to take their gold to be made into gold coins. And so Charlotte becomes this hub for the gold mines that were popping up all over the Piedmont, including inside the city itself. So we're standing here. This is South End Charlotte and uh, Little Hardware is, well, right behind us here in the parking lot and Unknown Brewing is over there in the other corner. Back when the mine was operating here, what did this area look like? It was not a very attractive place. Uh, you used a lot of chemicals. Uh, you had a lot of wastewater. You had probably at uh, various times between four and 600 people that were basically camping out. That is Mike Sullivan, who's done a crazy amount of research on the old mines here in town. His day job is as a commercial real estate agent. And he says one day, one of his clients was digging around on some property. And I asked him, I said, what is going on back there? He said, I had to stop. I, I hit like a big hole. And I said, really? And I started wandering around, and the draft was unbelievable coming up out of it. It had a old white quartz uh, framed uh, entrance. I was like, that's a gold mine. And I started looking down in there, and, and the next thing you know, it, it happens every time. All of a sudden, other people heard about it in the office, and they were out there looking down in there. The mine shafts basically run underneath what today is Uptown and South End. In fact, that story about the mine underneath the Carolina Panthers football stadium, it's true. Contractors hit them when they were building the place in the 1990s. They hit uh, some of the mine shafts, they hit some gold. Uh, some of them were fairly extensive with rail cars and such, and they were concerned that the public would find out about it and it would slow the process down for the Bank of America Stadium, so they kept it sort of quiet. So nobody knew about it while they were doing it, just because they went 
you know, amateur prospectors coming out there and, and looking for gold out there on the construction site. That's exactly it. And, and apparently they did a good job because it was several years later and I was talking with someone and they said, oh, we hit a bunch of them. So I was like, really? I never heard of that. <laughs> and I, my ear would have been a little more tuned to that than most folks. Mining used to be very big here. It brought the mint and miners, prospectors, international investment, and other types of business. There were uh, alcohol that was sold much more freely, and there were uh, houses uh, that were, let's just say, your sisters were at. So, <laughs> well, um, hopefully not my sisters. Uh, yeah, someone's sister, I'm oh, sure. Yeah, could yeah. be. Full disclosure, I don't have any sisters. Anyway, all of that, according to local historian Tom Hanchett, did not make Charlotte into a major city. Why didn't it end up being that, that thing that made Charlotte into a bigger bigger place? California. The California gold rush in 1849 was immeasurably richer. And anybody who was looking for gold, looking to get rich quick, um, did not come south after 1849. The Mint uh, stayed uptown on Mint Street until the 1930s when it got torn down. Uh, reassembled as an art museum out in the suburbs. It's still there off of Randolph Road in Charlotte. Um, but the, the banks that had opened up during the, the gold boom of the early 19th century um, closed one by one. And by the time you got to much after the Civil War, um, gold was a, a happy memory, but only a memory. And today, the land that was once mined is some of the most expensive property in Charlotte. There is likely still some gold down there, but the ground is more valuable now for what you can put on top of it rather than what you can dig out below it. The area that we're in right now, where all the mines were, is now called the Gold District. It is, and uh, it is uh, bars, restaurants, and it keeps growing, as and you can see. Yeah, there's another, there's a crane right over there. They're hard to find, aren't they? Right oh, here? yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen one of these in Charlotte before. <laughs> There seems to be construction happening all over the place, but there is one empty piece of land in South End with no construction cranes on it. And that is what Mike and his colleague Karen Wingett both want me to see. So, and so this, we're like on, this is like a gravel empty lot here. Yes, you can't build on it uh, because of the shafts. Okay, uh, yeah. where is it? Here we go, I, I knew it was over. I was getting off, off centered there. So this is, this is it right here? Yeah. It's a concrete slab that covers the main entrance into what's known as the Rudisil mine. What would this look like if you removed the slab? Would it just be a hole that went straight down on the ground? It would be a very big hole with very weak land around it. Yeah. In the 40s, they started pushing automobiles down here so that if you could actually do a cross-section of this particular shaft, you would have a timeline of our economy by, by automobiles. There's one from the 40s, one from the 50s, one from the 60s, and they just kept putting them in there to try and shore up the ground. So, so this is this has turned into the, the world's uh, most linear auto uh, wrecking yard is like right below this this slab here. Today, every mine entrance in Charlotte is either buried or blocked off, just like this one. So you can't actually see what's inside anymore. Instead, you have to use your imagination. And in a way, that's a perfect representation of gold mining. Our vision of what's still down there may be more valuable than what's actually down there. Most people didn't strike it rich. Most people didn't make a living. But I think it's that way in some way in your mind, you can think bigger than your own life where it's at at that point. And maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the whole conception of hope that, you know, I hope I can get better and this is the vehicle to get me there. It feels like I struck gold, like I stumbled upon a truckload of super rare Brosky got paintings that were just sold for much dough. Homie, this hustle is in my blood flow. You may understand it, these standards are what I uphold. The world is cutthroat. So that is the story of the first boom in Charlotte. A boom that eventually went bust. But the next big thing is still going on today. A boom that's brought billions of dollars to town. Literally. We will go back underground to look inside a very large vault that is in a very hard to reach place. That's all ahead 
when we come back. Welcome back to Away Message. I'm Jeremy Markovich. I grew up in the 1990s, and so when I think of a bank vault, I think of this TV show called DuckTales. It's a Disney cartoon, and the beginning of it features the scene where Scrooge McDuck dives into this giant vault filled with piles and piles of gold coins. He pops up, spits a few out, and look, I know that this is not even close to real life, but as it turns out, there is a giant vault in Charlotte. And just like DuckTales, it is full of money. An insane amount of money. In fact, if you've been walking down a sidewalk uptown, you may have walked right over it. Now, as a rule, the people who run it rarely let anyone inside. But for some reason, they made an exception. Hey, good. And so I pull up to the Federal Reserve Branch in Charlotte, what might be one of the least imposing buildings in Uptown. It is three stories tall, it's granite and marble, looks very 90s. That's perfect. Just go ahead and turn the vehicle off. Sure. You can open all the exterior doors and your hood. As you might imagine, the security around this thing is super tight. They check my car and then me. How do you spell your last name, sir? M-A-R-K-O-V-I-C-H. And then I am escorted into an elevator that takes me down into the basement. From there, I walk into a room with an unusual name. Hi, we need access to the man trap, please. Okay, Miss Kelly. Thank you. I feel like I have not been intimidated the entire time, but then you tell me I'm walking into the man trap and I feel like something bad is about to happen. We call it the man trap because when you come in, you can't go out until the doors are closed. Uh, okay, gotcha. Kelly Stewart is the one who runs the cash operation here. She's taking me on the tour. And we start walking around inside this maze of corridors. There are some rooms with people counting money and stuffing it into clear plastic bags. There are a surprising number of cubicles. And it's all being watched. There's a ton of cameras on. I mean, there's just camera, 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 camera yeah. all over the place. So it, there's no, doesn't look like there's any inch of that room that is not covered by some kind of camera. Several hundred. Wow. The scope of this place is hard to get your head around because our perspective of money has been sort of ruined by TV shows and movies. I got to do it, man. Dude. There's this scene in Breaking Bad where one of the criminals has to pause for a moment to lay down on this giant cube of cash. We are here to do a job, not channel Scrooge McDuck. You know, whether it's in films or, you know, you have a certain image of what you think a certain amount of currency is. And um, it, it really is... Uh, very surprising how a small amount can actually amount to a very large value. At the Federal Reserve, it's hard to know how much money is down there. For one thing, they won't actually tell you for security reasons. But for another, there's just not much money, you know, laying around. There's no sack with a dollar sign on it. Instead, there are these beige metal boxes on wheels about the size of a gas grill that you might have on your back deck. What are these carts right here? So these are currency buses. So they house anywhere from 280 to a little more than 300 bundles of currency. How much money are we talking about in each one of these? So a bus of hundreds is gonna, if it's there's 280 bundles, you're probably talking about 28 million in a single currency bus. At this point, you might be wondering what is this place? And why is it here? And why is there all sorts of money in the basement? Well, in short, the Federal Reserve is a bank for banks. If, let's say, Bank of America needs some actual cash, like tens and twenties or hundreds, they can borrow some of it from the Federal Reserve. Or if a bank has too much cash on hand, they can use it to pay back the Fed. The Fed does a whole lot of other things. It sets interest rates and monitors inflation and checks on the health of the overall economy. They also clear paper checks, although not nearly as many as they used to. But here in Charlotte, 
and at several other branches around the country, the Fed still handles a lot of cash. And in many ways, even though we have debit cards and online banking and Venmo, cash works in every situation, good and bad. With its last gasp, Matthew pounded the Carolinas with wind, rain, even fire. It's the worst flooding since Hurricane Floyd nearly 20 years ago. The water sending rivers... Over so after, let's say, Hurricane Matthew in, hit eastern North Carolina, what did you see here? Well, and if I'm, if I'm allowed to start with you, actually, as Matthew was coming in, because we start to see things before mm. things hit... Um, in our region, if we receive word that uh, a storm is coming, often what you will see is that financial institutions that are in that region will increase their orders for currency. So banks are getting all this cash in anticipation that sort of the systems that we take for granted now, your cell phone, your ATMs, you know, credit card processors, even just having power, the things that you need to sort of move money around in a very modern way are not going to be there. And so you're going to need cash to be able to live your normal existence when a lot of things aren't working. Yes, that, that really is what's behind it. Having that contingency, kind of that plan B. After the storm, the Federal Reserve in Charlotte gets a lot of cash that's wet or moldy or stuck together or ripped. They run each bill through a high-speed machine that figures out whether a note is in good enough shape to go back out into the world or whether it should be turned into something that looks like confetti. There's no mercy period. If, it, no if, mercy. if it's no good, it gets shredded on the spot. That's right. But during more normal times, banks in North and South Carolina need cash on a regular basis, which means you need to have a lot of it nearby, which means if you're the Fed, you need a very big, very secure vault. Um, if it's all right, I'll go ahead and take us to the vault. Sure. Um, so we're going to go on in and we'll do this. Okay. So we'll stop here if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> so this is our currency vault. It's about uh, three stories high, two basketball courts wide. Again, Kelly won't say how much money is down here, but my quick back of the napkin calculation says there are maybe tens of billions of dollars down here. That is an insane amount. It is like taking the entire economic output of, let's say, a country like Latvia or maybe El Salvador or possibly Iceland and converting it into U.S. dollars and then just putting it all in this room underneath the city of Charlotte. So what exactly does a room like that look like? The vault holds several thousand currency buses or can. Um, we have an automated crane system. Um, that, as you can see, slides up and down the aisles of the vault. Some of the robots have names like Smash, Dash, Crash, and Flash. They're totally controlled by a computer. Every so often, they'll just come to life, pick up a box full of cash, and take it to a worker who checks it out and loads it onto an armored truck. Humans don't often have to go into the vault, which means the vault itself is kind of boring. Uh, this is gonna just sound dumb of me, but when like, I always think of like, you know, the uh, DuckTales and they had the thing where Scrooge jumps into the giant bin of money, you know, but this looks like it's, it's very um, nondescript, I guess is the, is the word for it. We have this giant vault door, but like, it looks like a, just sort of like a, like a, like a warehouse. Yeah, I, I mean, as we were discussing imagery earlier, I think that's one of the, the imagery kind of disconnects for people when they do have an opportunity to visit the environment. The, the contents of the vault don't look like they expect they might. Um, I know this is sort of like, uh, you. I'll get, a, make, get out of the way of Smash here. I have this idea that like, money is this thing that is in my wallet in my pocket in my bank account that is like physical so like one dollar is worth one dollar and i don't really ever question that and there is the other side of it which is these are all paper bills physical things but they're built on faith and part of maintaining the faith in that money is being able to move it around to where it needs to go to make sure it's always there to make sure it's legit to make sure it's you know 
there's a whole kind of hidden system behind the money that we deal with in our wallet every day, and this is part of that system. That's exactly, you just described exactly what I, what I was getting at, yes. The great thing about really a lot of payment options is that we as consumers don't have to think about them when we're using them. So if we go to an ATM, we expect cash to come out, and we know what cash is gonna do when we use it. We don't think about it. When we swipe a debit card, we don't really think about how does that transaction flow and the inner workings behind it. We just trust that it's gonna work. But they work because we work, and that's, that's, that's key. After the tour, I come back up on the street, and I'm trying to figure out a way to tie all of this together. Hugh McCall, the ambition of the banks, the gold, the billions of dollars of cash moving around underneath my feet. I learned a lot about Charlotte's history, but it's history that's mostly out of sight, or hidden, or gone. And for a place where the gold once glittered and where money now flows, the past doesn't seem to be well-preserved. Tom Hanchett has a theory about that. As a historian, I hear from people all the time, oh, Charlotte doesn't value history. It tears down everything. And that's partly because even though we've never been a really wealthy town compared to others in the U.S., we have always had a little bit more money this year than we did last year, a little bit more people this year than we did last year. And that means that building gets to be 20, 30, 40 years old. Uh, we got the money to tear it down and replace it. Um, so Charlotte's glittering skyline is certainly a point of pride, and it's a very busy, bustling center city, um, but it's a city that lacks the, the soul uh, of a place that keeps its old buildings. Charlotte doesn't dislike history. It just has always had money to replace things before they're considered historic. Charlotte keeps moving forward, keeps going. It doesn't live in the past. It just builds on top of it. Away Message is written, edited, and produced by me, Jeremy Markovich, with production help from James Michkowski. Our digital manager is Kimberly Simpson, and our editor-in-chief is Elizabeth Hudson. We used music this week from Superstition, an artist from Charlotte, and Boulevards, who's from Raleigh and is out on tour right now. Additional music is by Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks this week to Falfurious Capital Partners, who helped arrange my interview with Hugh McCall. We have put a link to my profile of him in the show notes for this episode at away.ourstate.com, where you can also find pictures from the vault and more goodies from this episode. Also, a big thank you to Laura Fortunato and the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. They helped arrange our tour of the vault in Charlotte. And believe it or not, another podcaster got the same ideas about the vault and about banking history about the same time I did. His name is Nick De La Canal, and we are apparently on the same wavelength. Nick has a great podcast called FAQ City that answers questions that people have about Charlotte. Check that out if you can. This podcast is a production of Our State Magazine, celebrating North Carolina for more than 80 years. If you are not a subscriber, use the promo code AWAY and get $5 off a year subscription for you or for a gift. It is our thank you for listening to the show. And one more thing. If you are a cat... Stay away from the gold mine, okay? And I walked around, and that one guy goes, you looking for that gold mine? And I said, yes, sir, I am. I said, uh, is it over here? He goes, it's over there. And they sat there, and I wandered around, and, uh, and he said, you can't keep a cat around here. And I said, sir, he said, we've lost about a half dozen cats down in there. And uh, <laughs> he said, if they get in there, they're, they're gone. But uh, it- Gosh. And next up, I am heading deep into one of the most isolated places in the North Carolina mountains. Where am I going? We will hear the story of a man who used that remote spot to get away with an infamous crime, but could never seem to outrun his past. That is our next episode of Away Message. 
We'll be back with that soon. Yeah.